um, a project that I myself am involved in. So I might pipe in, um, not only as a moderator, but also a speaker. Um, but we have uh, Maria Pretzelis from California Digital Library, uh, Mike, uh, Brian Riley, also from California Digital Library, and Christian and Matt from Datasite um, joining us to talk about how PIDs, PIDGraph, and data management plans interconnect. So uh, you want to take it away, Maria? Yeah, yeah, thank you, John. Uh, so first off, I'm really sorry that I have my camera off. I've been having some Wi-Fi problems. Uh, so I actually got up early, I brushed my hair for you all, but then I decided that I would go safe and keep my camera off. So hopefully things will function well. Um, so John um, already kind of went through our agenda, but I'm gonna give you a project background about our work with machine actionable data management plans at the California Digital Library. Um, John's actually going to pipe in right away, uh, talking about how we're utilizing PIDs in DMPs and the importance of that uh, ecosystem. Uh, Matt from Datasite is gonna talk about our partnership with them. Brian's going to talk about some work we've done to model out the possibilities of the network DMP using older DMPs. Uh, he'll explain how that works coming up. And finally, the big part, um, Chris John's going to demo some new Jupyter notebooks that we built in order to really model the connections that you can create by using PIDs in DMPs. Um, and then finally, there will be a quiz. So please listen carefully. Um, you will be tested. Um, so first off, um, in order for um, the, the demo to run smoothly, sometimes Binder takes a little while to load in the browser. Um, so if one of my colleagues could just copy and paste that link into the chat, um, it would be great if you just open it up and keep the window running in the background. So when Chris John does his demo, it will be ready to go for everyone. So to just jump in with some background information, uh, one of the projects that I work on at CDL is the DMP tool. It's um, a longstanding platform for the, DM the creation of good DMPs uh, reflecting best practice. And uh, we offer guidance to help facilitate researchers in creating these kind of ideally um, exemplar DMPs. So that's kind of our goal. The platform has been around for almost 10 years. So it's been very successful, long lived um, community supported platform, um, really with the goal of connecting researchers with librarians and other support staff. So to have those conversations about RDM best practices. So the tool is widely used. Uh, we've got over 55,000 users now, um, 52,000 data management plans, 294 institutions using the DMP tool. And I get emails from folks every week wanting to, to, to join in. Primarily we're US-based, but we do have international uh, organizations using the tool as well. One of the really important things about the DMP tool and really this space as a whole is that we are very community minded. We all work, um, or many of these tools work from a shared open source code base that we collaboratively develop. Um, the principal developers of the shared code base are the DMP tool and our colleagues at DCC in the UK, they run DMP online. Uh, we meet all the time. Most of our development is done um, together and collaboratively and released on this open source platform. Um, that's really important as we're building these new next generation networked DMPs, as we work with partners like Datasite, all of these tools um, that we are developing and features are made available to the larger community in the form of this open source um, code base. So hopefully other implementations of Roadmap can take what we've built and implement them locally. So I've mentioned this term a few times, the networked DMP. Um, so I just wanted to kind of review what, what do we mean by that? Um, so really the, the goal of this is to allow um, data and information about researchers to be communicated and shared. Um, and shared across all of the stakeholders that are involved in sort of the RDM or uh, research lifecycle. 
So that includes metadata repositories, institutions, funders. Um, we're really looking at things like um, notifications and verifications, real-time reporting, automated compliance. Those are the kind of broad sort of use cases um, that we're looking at with this new networked DMP. And importantly, I think that if we build these systems right, if we build these tools right, if we make our partnerships um, in a careful and thoughtful manner, ideally the network DMP really should lessen the burden on researchers and grant administrators because these kind of connections are made behind the scenes utilizing things like the PID graph um, that we are going to share today. So a lot of our work on uh, network DMPs comes out of an ongoing NSF eager grant um, that we've been working on for a number of years. Um, some important things to know about this eager grant is it really came out of a community discussion and frameworks that were being discussed within RDA. So several RDA interest groups, the active DMPs interest group, ex exposing DMPs, um, the new RDA common standard metadata schema for DMPs. These are all really important conversations that helped us really um, formulate this grant and think about how we wanted to build these systems. So one of the key things that we're looking at in this grant is testing out the hypothesis that we can connect DMPs to the PID graph through this de RDA developed common standard. And that is what um, DataCite, they are a subaward on this, have been partnering with us to, to model out and demonstrate for you all today. So just quickly, some of the key examples or or definitions, components of a networked DMP is that they're connected through shared vocabulary, they're actionable by humans and software, they're versioned, and they are public. So as part of building out these systems, our first step at the DMP tool was to build kind of the fundamental infrastructure. This really involved a reworking of a lot of of our basic systems within the DMP tool to allow DMPs to become machine actionable or machine readable. Um, so we had a lot of kind of baseline work to do before we could really go out and integrate with, with other systems. Um, so currently that involves a new feature, which we still have in the test environment. It will be released in production very soon. That actually mints um, IDs for DMPs. We currently have uh, support for ROARs within DMPs, funder registry IDs, ORCIDs, and Brian is just building a, one of my sort of most anticipated new features, which is um, using the registry of research data repositories. So researchers will be able to connect specific outputs to their anticipated repositories. So it's really important for networked DMPs. Um, Brian also did a ton of work building a new API that is compliant with the RDA common standard metadata schema, which we needed um, before we could really go out and do any of these, any of this uh, integration work. Um, feed, uh, users can also export their plans as RDA compliant JSON within the tool. So I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop because we have a lot of people um, to, to get through today. So I just wanted to pass it to John real quick to talk about the ways in which we are modeling connections via the PID graph. And I will continue to drive the slides for you. Great, yeah, thank you, Maria. And I think this section, I, I'll move very quickly because I know we wanna show the demo. Um, as Maria mentioned, um, the work that we've been doing with uh, CDL, the DMP tool, and with DataCite is to use identifiers to connect data management plans and anticipated information around, or information about anticipated data outputs into the future. And so what that really means is making sure we stake a claim with the plan at the time that it's created, allow updates of that plan over time, and make sure that that plan can then be connected into a PID graph so we can see other outputs that exist. Um, the best, day, best way we could do that is through um, DOI infrastructure, data site infrastructure, and through event data, which is a system that allows for assertions against DOIs to take place. And so if you show the next slide, you can see, you know, really the, the goal of this is for us to be able to um, stake a claim. So if you see that, that center 
purple uh, dot and say, this is what um, has been said in this um, data management plan, assign an, a persistent identifier against that plan, and then start to see all the connections as they arise over time. So if there's a published article, uh, there are people associated, places associated with it, the PID graph starts to grow. Um, if there's a grant associated with it, all these things start to grow through a PID graph through the connections of crosswalking different persistent identifiers. And I won't go on because we want to see it in action. Um, it actually works. So I will pass it on to Matt to talk a little bit more about it. Great, thanks, um, John and Maria. And so just following on and keeping it also fairly brief so we can get into the live demo. Um, we've spoken that this really leverages the PID graph. And so we all know that persistent identifiers are useful, but they're only useful when we have quality metadata behind those persistent identifiers. And so that's the crucial piece here that enables us to connect the pieces of the research landscape. Um, so um, really what we've done here is leverage the PID, PID graph, and this now allows us to connect persistent identifiers together via relations um, in their metadata to enable the discovery of the connections um, at least two hops away. And next slide. And so research we know is a graph. And so um, one example is with the persistent identifier, we understand that this author produced this publication, but we may not know that this author produced this publication, um, which was related to this other publication, related to this other author, related to this other institution. And so bringing this all together using the DMP as the body that can connect all of these pieces together is really powerful. And you'll see um, this in action in a moment. Next slide. And so one of the key things here, and this is what the DMP tool does, is make sure that this relational metadata um, is deposited when the DOI is registered. And then we leverage the event data hub to bring in all of these, um, this additional information from make data count as an example. So usage um, information, we also bring in citations and other related information into the um, graph. Next slide. I think that's over to Brian. Yes, thanks, Matt. Um, so the the uh, DMP tool um, sort of once it's created uh, loses sight of uh, the research project as it moves forward. And so um, to sort of work on this, we had to go back and look at historical data. Um, and to do that, we worked with our partners at Beco Demo to identify um, data management plans that resulted in published data sets and uh, journal articles. Um, and so the data we received from BicoDemo um, and the DMPs themselves were not actually generated in the DMP tool. So we needed a standardized way to work with them and expose them uh, to the PID graph. Uh, next slide. Uh, to accomplish that, we transformed the CSV files we received from BicoDemo into the new RDA common standard that Maria mentioned and this format allowed us to easily convey all of the rich connections the DMP has to contributors, funders, data sets, et cetera. It also gave us the opportunity to test out this new metadata standard. Next slide. Once we had the data in the standardized format, we were able to load it into our new DMP hub system. Uh, we developed the DMP hub as a simple repository for DMP metadata that provides a landing page for a DMP and also sends the metadata to data sites that we can acquire a DMP ID. Uh, next slide. Um, here's a screenshot of the DMP Hub's landing page. Um, some features uh, to note are in the upper right-hand corner. There's a link back to the actual uh, DMP PDF document uh, that BicoDemo hosts. Um, we also have ROARs, ORCIDs, and other rich identifiers. Um, and then there's some examples of uh, citing the DMP. And next slide. Um, and then at the, the bottom half of the landing page, um, there's uh, a section where we're displaying the relations uh, that BicoDemo identified. So we have uh, published data sets and uh, publications. Um, and once all of this was loaded into the DMP hub and we've received our DMP IDs, we're able to see that information in the PID graph. And so uh, I'll transition this over to Christian to kick off the demo, Let's see what we came up with. 
And so for this, I'm going to go Thank ahead you. and stop the screen sharing from Ria and take it, turn it over to Christian to share his screen. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead and toggle off um, Brian and Matt's video just so there's. Okay, I think I'm in the demo slide, right? Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. correct. excellent. So, uh, well, this is what everybody was waiting for, right? Uh, this is the dangerous part because it's a demo. Um, if you have not gone to the link that we shared early, uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, uh, probably right now it's too late to go. So just follow along, but if you are there, just stay there. We will get to each other parts. Uh, I'm going to show this demo in two sections. Uh, uh, the first one to say is that we are using a Jupyter notebook to, as, as was mentioned before, show how DMPs uh, get all these connections using the PIV graph. Um, it's a very brief introduction, but basically for anybody participating in the demo, this is a game of how good you are to pressing shift plus enter. And you won't have to do much in that, but just to follow along what I do. But if you are not there, don't worry. Just look at the screen and I will do everything. You see. And you can go later and see and try for yourself. Uh, we're using Jupyter Notebooks for this because it uh, helps us to get a demo quickly. And also it's kind of easy to share so everybody can use it and see how actually it's created. Um, the first demo that I'm going to show is something that uh, I think Maria mentioned. Uh, uh, John actually mentioned at the beginning, trying to find out all the connections that a DMP uh, persistent identifier has through using the, uh, the PID graph. And the demo that you will see is practically a really simple tool in which you can select the, the DOI of DMP that you need to, and automatically this will make a query to all the services of the PID graph and try to find all the connections available. Um, and I will show that in action in a second. The second one is about uh, doing the same, but not from the point of view of organizations, funders, or, or even repositories, in which I'm going to select uh, practically now not a DMP DOI or persistent identifier, but an organization persistent identifier or a funder persistent identifier, and using those identifiers to actually find all the DMPs that are related to that organization, or funder, or repository. So that's basically two demos. Uh, and I'm going to jump then immediately to the screen. Um, and I guess if you are have been following the demo along, uh, and John can tell me if someone has been saying that they are not there, you should be on this screen at the moment. Um, and we are going to open this file that says, uh, this is the third file in the list, it says demo user story single which will jump to this, to this screen. When you have practically a brief description of what uh, this Jupyter notebook that demos the, P, uh, the DMPs does. And as I said, it's basically a, a game of con shift and control. So practically you just have to click shift, uh, click on the, this piece of text, go for shift and control once, twice, three and four times. And what it's going to do is just running there, everything is running correctly. And what you get is that when you select a DOI, whatever it is for a DMP, you practically, practically will get uh, immediately after uh, a query that will go to the PID graph and bring all the connections of that DMP. In this case, it's a DMP related with turbulence uh, and spirit settlement. And it gives you all the, organi the organizations that are connected to that DMP, which in this case is the San Francisco State University, Funders is the different organizations that are related in the funding, all the four publications that are available, all the data sets that are connected to that one, and all the people that are related to that one, and to the uh, publications and data sets that are there. And you could choose any other one from the tool as well, run it again, and see if there will be any other ones. For example, this is a DMP that clearly doesn't have many connections set up, but there will be some others that actually have many connections. So for example, this other one, and, and you will get something different for each of, the, each of those ones. So we put uh, many other uh, niceties around here that can help you to actually visualize this better and see how the PID graph is growing there. I cannot look at a chat box, but I would like to know if anybody's following that one so far. 
We are getting a few people saying, wow, oh, okay. awesome, wow. so amazing. Great. Uh, as I said, I'm go uh, you can play with it and just have to click on the same one. And as I said, just shift and enter and you can execute each of the, uh, each of the cells, changing the, each, uh, looking at each of the DOIs. I'm going to move to the second one, which is about organizations. And this is the first, uh, the second file on the list that will give you a screen like this one. Uh, and this one is pretty very similar. Uh, you are going to select basically uh, an organization. In this one, we did a little bit more limited because there are just a few organizations here involved uh, that we have. And practically, when you run it, you will have, uh, in this case, is uh, for example, the founder in this one is the European Commission. And I said, and it's selected already. It will give me all the DMPs that the European Commission has is declared as a founder in DOI metadata, as well as the number of people that are involved in that DMP, the number of publications, which in this case, there are not that many, and the number of data sets. Uh, many of these DMPs are created before everything is created, so those connections sometimes don't exist. And there are some parts in which metadata is not accessible, but in many cases you will have that that uh, values completed field. Uh, here I'm only showing ten because it's just a small page, but depending on how many, uh, at the European Commission uh, has many many DMPs already related to their fund ID. This is another example with a repository, uh, but this is uh, using the California Digital Library. They they also are not only an organization but also a repository, and you can see all the DMPs, there's a list at the end of 10 of all the DOI, the DMP DOIs, with the number of people involved in each DMP, the number of publications related to those DMPs, and then data sets that are there. Uh, also showing who is the organization that's producing them and the, and the organization that's funding them, which is case, and for all of them is the National Science Foundation. And this is practically the way, the way that both of them must work. Um, not sure if we will have too much time to play with it, if there are many comments about this, but practically you can go to the page and as I said, just execute cell by cell and, and you will see with the changes there. We can make modifications to our more in this ones, but as, as uh, mentioned before, these are demos we just want to show the potential of what an application using the PID graph and a PID for the MPs can do. Uh, and I think I can hand over if there are no questions more about that. Yeah, I think that sounds great. If you want to go ahead and just um, share the slides again, we can probably just go right back to the slides. Oh, yeah. One of the, one of the um, points of what we're trying to do here is, you know, very often people talk about the, um, the value of persistent identifiers as something that creates connections, but then we don't show in real time or in real use cases how those connections can actually support the world of research. And so this to me is very exciting because it's allowing us to have a true example of how we can leverage the PID graph and all of the work that we put into persistent identifiers to showcase um, that true value. Um, and so I know that what's we have a um, a quiz that we put together um, that you can go to. Um, it's in the chat, um, but I don't know if we want to maybe just move into uh, the the um, the close up or how would you like to handle this, Maria? How would you like to handle the last couple? Um, well, maybe as we close up, people could go to the quiz and we could do it. Does that make sense, Matt? Sure. Okay. Um, so. I'm not sure who's driving the slides, but I will just um, talk through them. Uh, so as we're building these networked DMPs, one of the things that we are looking at is examples of some real life pilot projects that were able, give us the opportunity to really demonstrate the power of these connections that we can make by having PIDs within a DMP. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so the big project that we have working towards this is called the Fair Island Project. Um, and that really has sort of two main um, components to it. Um, the first being developing optimal data policies um, that are supporting um, open data. And the second being um, really looking at the technical infrastructure 
um, that's needed in order to, to support this. So specifically, that is looking at network DMPs working off of machine actionable data management plans. Um, so with the Fair Island project, we're working with field stations managed by the University of California, um, namely the Tetaroa field station, which is our first um, sort of pilot um, field station that we're working with. Um, and really the, the goal of it is to have this working research environment where we're able to implement good data policy, good technical infrastructure, um, so that we can analyze the downstream effects of these policies and this sort of network DMP on the resulting release of data. So this is a ongoing project. We just hired a um, project manager consultant, Erin Robinson from ESIP. And so she is working really hard to, to really get this moving along. I think you'll hear a lot more about this project, um, maybe at um, upcoming our uh, next year's Pitapalooza. We'll certainly be present at RDA, so you'll be hearing a lot more from it. We have a project website, which is um, fairisland.org, uh, if you want to learn more about it. Um, these, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, these are some of our um, partners in it. So again, RDA is really core to a lot of the work we do. Um, we're working again with the Tetsuro Field Station and the University of California Natural Reserve System. So they manage all of the field stations run by uh, UC. Um, and that's really the way we're gonna be able to roll out a lot of the new methods that we are developing through this project. And I could go on, but I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and um, if, yeah, just a few places if you want to learn more. We often blog on the DMP tool blog about our work on networked DMPs. And again, the Fair Island website is probably the best place to learn about what we are building right now. So do we want to open it? Open it.